I'm Leah. I'm Derek. And this is Let's Talk Outdoors. Leah, it's good to see you again. Hi, Derek. It's been a while. I know. I'm excited to get back into this. Here we go. Season two. Yes. And we are starting off with a, a special guest this week. Yeah. His name is Derek Schmidt. Yeah, he's joining us from uh, a Chapaways First Nation. He teaches grade eight at, uh, oh man, I'm going to try this and see if I butcher it. I'm sorry. Uh, Kagisaweo. Kagisaweo? I'm pretty sure. School. Um, he's been doing a bunch of stuff. He started in land based programming, like right when we got shut down, like just, just before all COVID kind of started happening. He had the land based program. He did some online stuff. He's been doing, um, still like a mix of in-person and online and, uh, and he runs dogs. So, uh, I'm pretty excited to chat with him today. Yeah. Let's see what he has to say. All right. Well, let's get rolling. Uh, Garrick, welcome to the podcast. We're excited to have you here today. No, thank you for having me. It's uh sure it's, uh, it's a treat and a pleasure to, to be on with you guys. Awesome. Can you can you just uh, like start us off? Just tell us a little bit about where you're at and, and what you're doing right now. So right now I'm a middle years land based uh, educator out at Ochapways First Nation at uh, Cookies Whale School in uh, the southern part of the province. Um, right now with the pandemic and everything, we're we're teaching online. Uh, so with that, I'm still trying my best to run my land-based program as effectively as I can while remaining, um, making sure that those relationships are remaining intact with my students that I have. And um, so right now I've had in the last, I think three, four weeks with my students, we've done activities like harvesting red willow, um, cleaning the bark off and making traditional ish snowshoes from that and then uh, kind of getting into the survival section because normally in my in the curriculum that i've designed for my program i've done the winter months kind of as the survival section of uh, of my curriculum so right now the kids there built survival shelters with some of their older siblings that have been in, in and around my program last year and um, some of the parents as well they're getting in uh, involved with their students as well when when they're out and out on the land making the quincies and twos of the a-frame style shelters and 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 uh, i guess at the end of my day i'm out being a full-time musher uh, I have a kennel of about 18 dogs right now I went from eight and kind of grew real quick one of my lead dogs had a <laughs> litter of five kind of accumulated a few more over <laughs> since then so it's been wow. busy but I absolutely love, love doing what I do there's so much to unpack there there's like just in that intro I, I have like 10 questions on here so um <laughs> I first like heard about you, you had, um, I think it was a CTV yeah. came out and did it, did a thing with you, right? Yeah. So uh, the first time that CTV had came out, I was doing an internship at uh, seven stones uh, community school in Regina. And I, with uh, the co-op that I was with, his name is Kevin Parisian is a SunTap alum. And I come from the SunTap program in Regina as well. And, fantastic program but um i ended up showing my grade four or fives that i was interning with how to tan a moose hide so that got way into the project and uh, um, with the with the hide i ended up having the students do uh christy belcour artwork on that and perfect time I'm Christy had just had an art exhibit open up in the, at the McKenzie art gallery. And I had been in contact with her, sending her up it's of what the kids were working on with the fleshing and tanning process and painting her beadwork style artwork onto the hides. And, um, 
I, and I invited her to come to the school, but just with time constraints and everything, she wasn't able to, to come to the school. But luckily enough, I had a couple of my students and their parents, they came to the um, main art exhibit unveiling and they got to meet Christy and tell stories about the project and to see these Indigenous and non-Indigenous students come from a really tough situation living in the hood in Regina and down like downtown area and to see that pride come out it just cool. it made everything that I do as an educator fall into place right then and there it's like okay I am in the right field this is what I'm gonna do That's- sounds like you really brought together the community in that experience yeah I'm curious if yeah. in your new where you're teaching now um with how do you relate your program with the the community that you're teaching in i've had a lot of really good um feedback from the community um unfortunately like with covid and everything in the last year well i guess so last year um i did uh, a big ice fishing day kind of to bring the it was uh i think the grade one of the grade twos and the grade eights that I was teaching, the grade nines, the grade, I think, 10 and 11 students. So we had a, a, a large amount of students out on the ice fishing that day. And we did snowshoeing. We did traditional hand games out there. And it was a really good, solid day of the kids that didn't always get a chance to be on the land for them to be on the land and kind of experience what uh, some of the things that I was doing. Um, and then this year, I was fortunate enough to do fur hunting, harvesting camps, um, October and November this last school year, I guess this school year, and having community members come out and support and um, giving back to the community too. Like we harvested a bison, one camp, the next camp we harvested a moose. The next camp, we harvested a white-tailed deer. The next camp after that, we harvested a deer and an elk. So, and all the meat, like, we didn't keep for ourselves. We gave some to the kitchen staff for the staff to cook for for the school, for the kids, because we do uh, meal programming for the students. And then everything else, we gave back to the community. We knew there were, uh, especially with a lot of First Nations communities, there's more than just maybe three or four people living in a house. So we knew that there were large numbers of people living in one, in one home. So we would give 40, 50 pounds of meat to one family. And mm-hmm. it, it helped a lot when, especially when you harvest an animal and it's 1500 pounds. Yeah. So it's uh, <laughs> a lot of freezer space. <laughs> yeah. A lot of, well, we freed up a little bit of freezer space, but we still have a lot of meat left to grind up and do some do some dry meat and it yep. was really cool um the grade nines we did when we did our hunting camp in october it had snowed out and um just to kind of see some of the resiliency that i was de- that my male students that were kind of like your video game type mm-hmm. of students they never really liked to be outside um they slept outside and like we had people the whole shebang everything um for the week but they chose to sleep by the fire under the stars and uh they woke up one morning covered in like four or five inches of snow. and i was like guys you okay yeah <laughs> 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 and uh but that same day we had um a su- suicide prevention walk out on the community and um that whole the whole week of the camp we were drying uh meat over the fire from the moose that we had harvested and elk meat as well from other members of the community that had dropped off and we're doing this walk and we're handing out dry meat and by the time we get to the uh, chief denton memorial complex out on old chap everybody has a piece of dry meat and everybody's talking and like where'd you get this where'd you get that from well the grade nines are out hunting right now so it's really good to Cool. For everybody to get that one little piece from what the kids have done that week is really awesome. Cool. And anyway, the, the students are giving back to the community and getting involved. That's really cool too. You talked a bit about like uh, getting the kids out on the land um, a few times. Why? Why is that important? What do you think? It's really important to 
educate and show knowledge that hasn't been passed on. Um, things that I've learned since I was a little boy, things that I've learned in the last year, the last five years uh, from mentors and elders. Because um, these things aren't aren't taught at a, in a desk. Um, students may read about it in a book. They may see it on TV or in a, like on a YouTube session right um and then with with the age group that i work with the behavior issues kind of come into play because the hormones are kind of starting to work in the (laughs) the six to nine area yeah yeah and they're trying to figure out who they exactly are trying to figure and um where they fit in right so i've seen really huge behavioral changes and really good connections to the land connection to community connect back to the families um with with getting the students up onto the land um and this last year <clears throat> we've been outside every single day even with covid we're out there. monday to thursday we run on a four-day week with school and I always make sure that the kids are dressed properly and making sure that um, if they got a, if they don't have the right pair of boots, that they have something that they can switch into and just making sure that everybody is taking part and uh, having a, having that turn at learning at, at, at that time. Do you find the students have resistance to going outside or has it become the norm for your group? Last year, I think I had three students who were like, no way, man, I ain't going outside. I'm going to stay. I'm just going to stay at home that day. Well, you know what? It's a small community. I hear you. I'm going to pick you up. So you better be ready. (laughs) And now I have yet to have one student complain about being outside. Some of the kids that complained last year come on team camps this year. They've grown in such amazing young men and women. Um, that's it, it's unreal. I I couldn't be more proud to kind of be among their journey and their on the on their walk walk mm-hmm. of life as as they're continuing to grow and learn. I think there's something there, like in the in the bush and those hunting camps, and the, that they just kind of I don't know. It tears down a little bit of the. I don't know if it's like a, a front that we put up or it it makes you kind of like see yourself maybe a little bit more than the than the image you put up. I don't know. I, it's hard to describe, but I, yeah, I feel I hear what you're saying. About. I, I totally I totally get where you're what you're saying, too, because I've seen that coming again and again and again with students. And you kind of you go from that four wall constraint and that's kind of the big idea on why I wanted to and yeah why why i wanted to teach the way that i do Mm -hmm. is to get kids out of the structure to be free in a sense and it's like okay yeah i have my lesson plans i have my year year plans my curriculum all of that and it's tied to saskatchewan preventable outcomes but the way that i plan it out in my weeks or my days it's like okay we have say these three options you guys, we can do this. We were doing this yesterday, or we can do this or that. And um, on hunting camps, with uh, seeing the walls come down, kids have, uh, well, I guess even even the adults do that have come out to camp. Um, it's more of a relaxed vibe mm-hmm. that the kids have, that I have. I'm not, uh, I've never been one to be, I guess, a, a dictator ish type of teacher or a leader in the communities that I've been in it's um lead by example right so I'm gonna help out as much as I can and the kids they're gonna see that and help out and um but even as as indigenous people too we we joke around a lot Mm -hmm. and uh I think that tends to make things a lot easier and kind of settles settles things when when it might be new to a situation i guess you you touched on this a bit but we did want to ask maybe a bit more about how you go about blending traditional knowledge with the curriculum with the mainstream curriculum and the knowledge that i teach um it's kind of nice to hit 
not just one subject at a time. I'm able to, because right now I'm specializing in science and land-based, but I'm able to kind of help some of the other staff out and hit social and health and talk about the signing of the treaties or some of the treaty outcomes um, that the province has put into place. Um, and taken out of the, the normal way of learning from tech mm -hmm. and relate it back to the connections, back to the creator, back to the, the, the stories that I learned this, even this last summer from Kevin up, up North at Minnesota and with, with everybody up there mm -hmm. and uh, relating it back to the times where, where it was just the four legged roaming, roaming turtle Island and, having like when I when I right now when I kind of think of science some of the kids were kind of tying into some of the electrical and electricity components in the curriculum and talking about um the electrical say the biodiversities the components in living organisms and the change in the seasons um and even though in the winter time right now like telling um telling some of those traditional stories and just kind of trying to pass that along as best as i know how mm -hmm. did you grow up with uh like the stories and on the land and all that kind of stuff uh a little bit yeah um so growing up i guess i i, I grew up <laughs> my mom always tells people um when there's staff or colleagues, people that I've known for a really long time, when they finally meet my mom, she always say, says, uh, well, he wasn't born under a rock. He, he didn't just crawl up out of the bush. Like he didn't just become, he wasn't just this bush guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'd spend my, my summers and winters um learn medicines and learning some stories from from my grandparents and my mom and um but a lot of that didn't really come into play until i was older maybe like my mid to late 20s uh a little bit further on in my education path i guess uh spending a lot of time with elders at the university and then uh elders in communities that i was teaching in learning stories and customs from them and then um, a lot a lot of the time oh excuse me a lot of the time spent with kevin over this last year as well his uh I, i've learned a, a great deal from uh, from him and the family mm -hmm. why do you think it's important to pass on this knowledge so it's not forgotten um i think Kind of almost like a good movie when you think of it when you when you watch a really good movie you want to tell other people about it right mm -hmm. so for me when i learn a new skill or when i have a new practice or a new medicine that i learn about i want to share it with my students so that uh because i'm so excited about it i want them to be excited about it and the way that we go about learning and teaching and sharing knowledge in, in a good way I know just that passes on to them and that maybe that they show one of their little cousins mm -hmm. this in a couple of weeks or in a couple of months or maybe when they're my age and they have well, hopefully older than me when they have kids. <laughs> but uh <laughs> but hopefully that this that all the knowledge that I'm sharing with them is passed on uh some way or another um and i and i know it has already um even uh, some of the medicine knowledge that i've shared with with youth that i've done camps with even over the christmas break they've shared it with their family members when they got back home after the week and um, having having parents message me after like oh my god i didn't know this or that about this plant like that that <laughs> that it could be used for this and we can only harvest it at this such time during the year or even time of like more afternoon right mm -hmm. if someone wanted to incorporate more land-based learning and traditional knowledge into their teaching practice how how could they do that and where would they start 
um, both, I guess, from an indigenous perspective and, and as a, possibly as a non-indigenous educator? Um, I think both an indigenous and non-indigenous edu educator, um, probably first thing to do um, if you have elders in your school, work, work with, with yours. Um, they're the knowledge carriers. Uh, make sure to, to present your, your tobacco to them and ask whatever guidance questions you may have about the community or any land-based practices. Um, and then even asking those elders for maybe community, people in the community that might be able to help you. Um, and then even just picking up a good book too, like for survival skills there's there's lots of really good books out there about uh teaching good like bushcraft knowledge and there's a lot of good pages out there online that uh teach a lot of good i guess survival skills uh, and it's it's really good to see that this is kind of catching on now especially with covid um because mm. now's the time for people to be outside and like <laughs> It's it's awesome to see that so many people are reclaiming this knowledge and learning it, and because uh, don't know it. And, uh, I don't know if the world's gonna just kind of go <laughs> one day, and <laughs> we're gonna have to go back to living in the bush or not. So yeah, <laughs> that was good to have as an in case. Yeah, that uh, made me think of one of my one of my male students in grade eight. He, uh, have you guys ever seen that Alone show? Yeah, up in Alaska or the yeah. yeah. Okay, so he's in grade eight. He loves this show and he wants to audition for it when he's old enough. Wow. So wow. even like on weekends or evenings with our Google Classroom now, I'll give him little side assignments and. <laughs> Is to like try to prep him as best as I can for him to, when he's old enough to go and just kill it. That's awesome. But uh, to see his drive and motivation for pretty much knowing everything I know and more. Yeah. Like, I, I wish I was like him when I was stage like that. This that that young boy, he's he's gonna go places for sure. Cool. Well, I'd like to hear more about these dogs. Yeah. Yeah. You want okay. to tell us more about right. how you got started and how, how you learn uh, about mushing? So <clears throat> I grew up in Indian Head, I, and that's where I come from. Um, and a friend that my mom had gone to school with, her name is Nancy Dragon, and she runs dogs up at Christopher Lake in northern Saskatchewan. And, uh, she's, I think she taught at Carleton High School and in PA as well. And I think I was about 13 or 14, maybe she had come down to town for Christmas. She brought a few of her dogs down over the holidays. And my mom was like, Hey, let's go see Nan and let's, let's go with these, these sled dogs of hers. So I went and I've, I've always been a dog. And I've always had like big dogs. In my life and seeing I think it was I don't know, maybe she had 12 dogs down. But uh, seeing these magnificent animals, I just absolutely fell in love with it. Uh, pretty much one. And then fast forward well, up until last year. Um, I didn't really get a chance to work with any dogs from like 14 or 15 years old <clears throat> up until last year, where uh, Kevin and the guys up at camp, up at County Asset, um, they came down to our school at Ardell Chapways for the week. It was um, right before February break, so it would have been next week, last year. Yeah. And so I was just getting into the swing of things. I just started teaching at Old Chap in January last year. Mm. We were out setting traps and snares. We had a really good trap line and um, ended up seeing that uh, these guys had these big trucks, big trailers outside, and they had all these dogs and like dog sleds outside. I was like, what the heck? Like, I kind of, I didn't really remember that this was happening this week. And I thought, holy 
holy crap, like this, this is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I got a chance to visit with Kevin and and his uncles and um and some of the other guys. And luckily enough, I got to teach my grade eight students how to run dogs, how to hook up dogs, how to switch up dogs. And they did so well at it. They got to drive dogs for the rest of the school one day. And wow. seeing some of the students, yeah, seeing some of those students with behavioral issues and some of this, like other community members were like, you're going to let him drive a team of dogs. Like, don't you know who he is? It's like, yeah, I know exactly who he is. Like, do you not see him doing absolutely fantastic doing this? Like, this is his niche, like being on the land and being with these dogs. Like it, it brings, a, a, like being on the land, it breaks those four walls down, but being with the dog, it like builds a person up even higher than what we were talking about before. Like it's, it, it's kind of spooky. <laughs> um and so that was a Wednesday that we ran dogs all day with Kevin and the guys and um great experience for for the kids and myself and at the end of the day um I knew that the guys they were going up to Cody for nation and it was cold that week about minus 30 minus 35 and we shouldn't have had it was, we were close to shutting down, but because Kevin and the guys were down, they're like, no, we're going to stay open. Like the TC, the dogs are here. We're just make sure the kids are safe. Right. And end of the day, my principal, uh, he comes up to me and he's like, so you want to go up and run dogs with these guys tomorrow? It's like, so do I have to take a day off or what do I got to, what do I have to do to go and run dogs with these guys tomorrow? Like, Oh my yeah. God. Like I just, I couldn't be happier. Right. And I put in for a sub and I was up at Cody super early, first thing in the morning. I don't even remember how long of a drive it was from Indian Head that day, but I just, it felt like just blink of an eye and a boom, I was there. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it was minus 40 with the wind chill, minus 45. Oh, but we were running dogs and <laughs> we, I, I just fell in love with it. I didn't complain. Kevin didn't complain. I had Uncle Cliff. He was there too. And we we had laughed a couple of times because these kids were coming outside in sneakers and tight jeans. And you know how kids get when they're <laughs> yeah. 10, 12. They're too cool to dress warm. Ah, yeah. No, I'm not going to yeah. dress warm or be yeah. sensible. No, I'm too cool for that. So yeah. we do our trail. And these older kids would get out of the dog sled and it's like, how was your ride? Good. <laughs> 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 and uh, I think it was about a week after that, Kevin had phoned me and we stayed in touch. And he was like, well, we're up at Saskatoon. Like we're coming down to Saskatoon and I want to stay when they're doing a, a festival there. And, if you want to come and work with the dogs and run dogs for the day, come up. So like you, yeah, like you count me in, I'm there. Anything to spend time with you and the dogs, I'm there. <laughs> and uh, ran the dogs all day. I think we ran a, geez, from maybe nine or 10 in the morning till like as the sun's going down. And there was a lineup all like, as far as you could almost see it, it was, it was nuts. But it was it was an awesome day, and uh, was was that for the Kona Festival? Is that what that was called? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, that was the Kona Festival. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I read about that and I was like, ah, I got to go down Saskatoon for this, but then yeah. it did not work out. Yeah, and then so I thought, well, I don't know when I'm going to be able to see these guys next, or when I'm going to be able to run dogs, and then. Uh, I got a message from Kevin, maybe beginning of May, and he invited me up to uh, up to his place, up to Kenayasik, up at Minnesota, and we did uh, that high tenant camp, and I, I got to see all of his dogs. And before then, I was looking for another dog. And I messaged him. He's like, "Yeah, like if if you know of anybody with puppies." <laughs> Just, just let me know. Like, I'd, I'd love another dog. Like, I, I'm missing having a dog at home. He's like, well, I can. It's Kevin. How Kevin is? It's 
Oh, I, I'll see. I'll see about it, okay? I didn't realize how many dogs he had at home. I, like, he must have between 60, 70 dogs up there. And it's, it's just wild. And I ended up getting uh, Kona. So Kona or Kuna is Snow and Cree. And I ended up getting her from Kevin in May. And she was my first real sled dog. And like before my mom and I, we had um, an older Siberian Husky, but she, there was no way she was running. <laughs> and great. Cause um, I spent from May almost to the end of August up at Kevin's working with the dogs, doing all these different uh, camps that we had done and taking almost absolutely everything that I could at the time. And because I knew maybe not this year, maybe not next year, hopefully within like a four year, it was my four year plan, let's say. To at least get a team of eight or a team of 10 dogs <laughs> and just to run them for fun, right? Yeah. And Kevin and I started talking more, and it was, well, I'll sell you eight dogs, two sleds, and a dog box for your truck. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, and I, and like from working with the dogs and handling them, feeding them, and taking care of them all summer, it was just like just the tip of the iceberg of getting into it, right? Yeah. But I knew how much responsibility and how much work it takes to take care of not just one dog, but now 18. Yeah. Um, but I never have a bad day with the dogs, and I'm with the dogs every day. I, mm-hmm. uh, it was great. I ran them 20. 20 miles today down in uh, Moose Mountain. So it was, it was a great day today. And uh, just, just to be able to, I'm glad that all of this has happened right now um, to kind of fast track my four year plan into a, I think a two or a three month plan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and uh, I guess now like, I've created a business like I run and own uh, Eagle Ridge Dog Sled Tours. Um, we do tours for Indigenous, non-Indigenous youth, um, tours for schools, First Nations communities. And this is like not uh, Monday to Friday. This is like on top of my teaching. So this is like <laughs> my weekends have now become yeah. these <laughs> lovely lovely kids so yeah. <laughs> but I, I love it <laughs> awesome. yeah. that's cool it, it's great too because uh before we close the school uh just before christmas break i had the, i had my students working with the dogs and they were learning how to handle dogs how to take care of dogs and like even kids were offering to pick up dog poop in the yard and feed the dogs i was like you guys complain like Last week, about having to pick up cat poop or dog poop at your house. Yeah, but Miss, yes, this is different. This is fun. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Now you you want to pick up poop for ten dogs? Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> huh. Just yeah. A- animals bring out something different in the students, probably. Yeah, not just the kids, but for the dogs to bring out that inner child. <laughs> And the adults and the elders in the communities that come out and um, even on weekends, February and March, I'm doing tours with the Métis Nation Sask and having like President McCollum wanting to come down and having him and I share stories of running dogs and like him coming from a northern community where a lot of people do it up there. And down here, it's kind of like, I'm the only guy. Mm-hmm. Like, come and give me your knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you've learned a lot in a very short amount of time and found something that you're really passionate about. That's really inspiring. Yeah. And I always, like, I knew when I was younger, 
better. I learned best by like watching and then doing practicing. And that's the exact same way that I teach. And that's that how that's how it's been in in the short amount of time. But it feels like I've known I've been in the family forever. Mm-hmm. But every time that I go up there, I learn something new. Mm-hmm. And it's it's, it's just breathtaking. I feel like there's so much more that we could get into, but we're running out of time. So, Garrick, we finish off all of our episodes with the same two questions. So I'll go first. Garrick, where is your, if you had to pick like your favorite place to adventure in Saskatchewan, what, where would it be? Uh, it's kind of a toss up and I've been thinking about this for a little while too. Um, either between like the back of my backyard at home, like in, uh, in the Coppell Valley, I could get for in the Brett, um, cause it's where I grew up and it just seems so, I feel so much more connected to the land running dog there now than say over the summer and like i was connected to the land there before because that's where our family homes then we have a rich history there as uh machif people and um so kind of bringing and revitalizing that back to south again and um kind of knowing that maybe my Great, 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 great. Grandfather might have ran dogs in the valley or like along from the Red Red River settlements. Um, I, I think that kind of would be really cool to see. Um, mm-hmm. It just makes me feel that much more connected. But, and it's a toss up between that and um, Minnesquan up, uh, up at Kevin's place. Um, I, there's, there's a real connectedness I have to the land there. Um, there's a real calming sense sense in the water up there, and every time that I think of think of it up there, I always think of the water rippling just off the shoreline, or when when we would go canoeing, and maybe the sun was was would be setting, or canoeing and harvest uh, picking duck eggs. Mm-hmm. Um, or even because I know like I, I love the sound of and I know most people may not, <laughs> but the sound that the dogs make when like when we go and feed or when we hook them up and run them. Yeah. And the amount of dogs I have are just like just a small portion of compared to what Kevin has, but I find a real calmness and peacefulness when I'm in the dog yard up there, especially when you get the entire dog yard to howl <laughs> after a feed, after a really good run. Oh, oh, it's, it's absolute, it's, it's breathtaking. And it, yeah. It's, it's almost perfect. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Wow. Yeah, so I know I didn't pick one place. That's okay. But I kinda, That's okay. A t- toss up. Oh. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if the, the other question's any easier. Our, our last question is, if you could change one thing about the world, what would it be? I think, and this would probably make our lives a lot harder, but it would probably be for the better. The one thing that I would change was to be, would to turn off technology, all technology for a week at least a week, maybe two weeks, just for people to reconnect, mm-hmm. to get them outside. May not necessarily be in the winter time because we yeah. have the best technology and you'd see all these tweets and Facebook posts about how many people were dead Yeah, because people don't know how to survive in the cold. Yeah. <laughs> and I, that, I joke about that, but it's kind of a reality, right? Maybe, maybe if we did that in the summertime, turned off technology for two weeks, said, Hey, get outside. Everything's getting shut off. Mm -hmm. Go. So I, uh, that'd be really cool to see. I I read (laughs) an article once about, um, these people who like experiencing lots of different things, couldn't sleep issues with diet issues with like all kinds of different issues. Uh, and they took them on like a, like an eight day winter camp with like no tech. 
and it was like uh and maybe it was even less than that like five days i think actually and it just they like it's they said it just completely reset how they sleep how they think how they feel like it just they came out like like it was like this like five day winter camp rehab session that just everybody felt amazing I was going to say, not, awesome. even, not only does a lack of technology help connect with the outdoors, I think it helps connect with other people, too, in mm-hmm. a much different and more meaningful way. Mm-hmm. Def- definitely. And that's that's one thing that I make sure to do whenever we do a hunting camp with the kids. And like even the, the last camp that we did at, down at White Bear, too. All the kids have phones. So, mm-hmm. hey, you know what? I have your parents, guardians somebody's number in my phone they have me on facebook or they can get a hold of me somehow yeah you're gonna give this phone up your whatever up for the week mm-hmm. you're gonna thank me for it by the end of the week and <laughs> <clears throat> with, with our school trips as well i i have the kids do journal writing at the end of the night so we'll sit on the fair and we'll and i'll teach them some traditional stories about the constellations up in the sky. And, and then after that, then they'll go and do their journal writing. But I, I can tell from that first day, kind of with the, the phone withdrawal, the second day, the writing gets a little better. The third day it gets even better. And the fourth day, the holy cow, you're <laughs> not even the same student anymore. Like, <laughs> who are, did you have somebody else write this? No, this is me the whole time. Holy crap. Like you got to get away from your phone more often, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good reminder for all of us, I imagine. Yeah. And I need to remember, remind myself, live in the moment, enjoy it. You don't always have to share to everybody what you're doing. Yeah. So, and that's kind of a tough thing to do. Mm-hmm. I, I, I post a lot of the things that I do online. Mm-hmm. So, but progress yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh well garrick it's been great uh having you around uh, and chatting with you tonight if people want to learn more about your work or hear learn more about uh the different projects you're working on how could they uh connect with you i have my twitter account so i think it's at garrick schmidt uh twitter i have of uh, instagram uh, for myself and the dog sledding, uh, like I had mentioned earlier, it's Eagle Ridge Dog Sled Tours, and then I have Facebook personal and uh, for the dogs as well. So it's uh, trying to trying to get trying to get out there as much as I can. I guess um, yep. no professional website yet, as per se. Yep. <laughs> awesome, awesome, great. Thank you. It's lovely to chat yeah, with hey, you. Thank, thank you guys so lot. much. This was this was fun. Derek, what was one of your takeaways from that chat with Garrick? I think uh, one of the biggest things, I mean, there's a lot to think about, a lot of uh, great stories to process, but he talked a little bit about being at camp and being more relaxed and joking around and how being outside of the walls of school changes um, the relationship that teachers have with kids and kids have with the, the each other and themselves and, and with the land. And I think that's an important thing for me to to think about and take away, like how how can I, I mean, right now we can't, I can't go camping where I am, but how can we maybe still find those opportunities to get outside of the classroom and, and outside of the walls and kind of break down those barriers a little bit more um, to give that, that opportunity to get to know each other and get to know the land a little bit better. What about you? I think about, I think about that a lot too, in terms of when you change your environment, it gives different people or students a chance to shine and show their, mm-hmm. their own skills that might not a student's skills might not reflect great inside the walls of a classroom, but when you can change the environment and then you really get to see more of a whole picture yeah. of a person, right? that can be really, really inspiring. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I loved hearing about his dog. Um, and to be honest, I'm not a huge dog person myself, but <laughs> just like the passion and the enthusiasm and the learning that has gone into that in such a short period of time. Right. And that he knew has known for a long time that it's something that he was interested in. Um, I, I find it really inspiring to hear those stories of people who like know what they want and then they just go and get it and figure it out and learn as they go. Yeah. Um, I think that 
a powerful lesson and a powerful way to learn. To move from a four-year plan to a three-month plan, just, yeah, we're going to go with it and we're going to figure it yeah. out. Like, that's awesome. Yeah. I love it. It'll all be good. Yeah. Well, that wraps up this episode. If you enjoyed the episode, make sure you share it with somebody else who you think might enjoy listening to it as well. And if you want to keep up to date with all our latest episodes, make sure you subscribe in the podcasting listening app of your choice. This podcast has been brought to you by Sask Outdoors, saskoutdoors.org.